Now what I meant to be is, see now this is, connector is a problem. I mean, we used to have a lot of problems with laptops. They have different type of laptop. Their laptop gets upgraded. Yeah. Now they have to figure out some hand that is in front and the copy is in front and now it will be different connector. So they have to put you can share it with It was waiting for you. Ah.
Hi everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about this. Can you hear me? Yeah. So today I'll be talking about the stream processing. Um, so I intentionally titled it stream processing so that uh, people don't find it intimidating. Uh, you know, but, but there is a lot of interesting stuff inside the talk, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, firstly, the only thing we ever need uh, to understand to build good systems is this, uh, are these four principles, right? Responsiveness, elasticity, resiliency, and message driven. So if you can build this, build any system using this, uh, ensuring these four properties, then you get a good uh, large scale distributed system, right? Uh, so basically at the end of the day, any service, what do we care about? It's responsiveness, right? As long as it is responding fine to the users, then it is perfect system, right? But to achieve that responsiveness, we need the system to be elastic. It should scale up and down with the load. Uh, it should also be resilient to errors, failures, and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, so all of that is actually enabled using message passing. Uh, all of that is actually enabled using message passing. So you can understand everything is actually built on top of fundamental principle of doing uh, a good, uh, on top of a well-designed message passing system, right? Uh, so that is what today's talk is about. How can we, uh, uh, how can we uh, handle message passing in a reactive way, in a more uh, uh, resilient way so that uh, we can build everything on top of it, right? So this particular uh, diagram, I took it from React to Manifesto. Uh, it is uh, uh, so, uh, so it's a manifesto that came in the last decade, I guess. Uh, so people thought, uh, you know, uh, we should not reinvent the wheel for building reactive systems. So they came up with some set of principles. Uh, you know, as long as we design things meeting these requirements, then we have good systems. So. Yeah, so coming to the reactive streams, what exactly is reactive streams? So uh, I told you I, I simplified the title of the talk as streams in Python. So, uh, but then we get the full power of streams when we make those streams reactive, right? Uh, so reactive streams, uh, so is actually a standard, it's a spec. Uh, just like the reactive manifesto I showed before, how to build reactive systems. So, uh, so it's a similar manifesto for reactive streams, the standard spec, whatever. Uh, so it came in 2013, fairly recent, given that you know we have been building Googles and Facebooks, you know, before 2013, right? So uh, so people from Netflix and uh, Lightband Pivotal they came together, built this, uh, uh, created this standard. Um, so so this is the essence of the reactive streams. Okay. A reactive stream is something that is, uh, sorry, uh, reactive stream spec. Uh, so basically it's all about processing asynchronous streams in a non-blocking, 
plus with back pressure. Okay. Uh, we all understand asynchronous, right? Uh, asynchronous means uh, systems don't wait for, uh, they're all loosely coupled, right? Uh, so uh, each one does its own work and uh, whenever they want to communicate, they communicate. Uh, so that's what asynchronous is. And non-blocking means we can have loosely coupled systems that are asynchronous, yet they can be blocked. Okay, uh, if somebody worked on Node.js or something, any any system with event loop, uh, you know that, uh, you know, they're all asynchronous frameworks, but still we can block the event loop, right? So, so non-blocking, asynchronous doesn't necessarily mean non-blocking. Non okay, non-blocking means, uh, you know, uh, when loosely coupled systems, when they are communicating, we should still ensure that, uh, you know, uh, no, no other system is blocked. Uh, or waiting for someone's response. Uh, and back pressure uh, means uh, essentially uh, when we are, when a system A is communicating with system B uh, and trying to send some messages and system B is unable to process those messages uh, at the same pace at which is received, send, uh, system A is sending, then there should be some way of communicating it back to system A saying that, hey, I'm unable to uh, handle that kind of load. Can you please slow down? Okay. Uh, so that's what back pressure is. Okay. Um, so I gave some interesting links there. Okay. You can uh, visit them and uh, to learn more about. So React to X, this is called React to Extension. That's a short for uh, React to Extensions. Uh, so it's actually a, a, a library, uh, it's also a programming model. It's a very simple programming model, yet uh, pretty innovative. Uh, again, it also came out in 2011, which is again, uh, it's quite uh, surprising that like, you know, uh, such a nice thing has taken so long. Right? Um, so basically it's created at Microsoft. Uh, uh, so basically uh, React UX is a library. It's also an API. Uh, so, it's basically meant for uh, doing asynchronous programming. So same stream processing, okay. Um, uh, so the, you, they use the word observable streams, okay. Essentially it means uh, asynchronous streams. Yeah. So I, I talked about reactive streams and I'm now talking about reactive extensions library. Okay, reactive streams is something that came in 2013. That's a standard. This is actually a library. It's an implementation. It's also a programming model. Uh, okay, uh, I'm I'll, I'm going to connect these together. Okay, I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, I'm telling two different things. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, it has five things in it. It's very simple, right? Five things. Observable. That's the key thing. Everything is built around observable. An observable is actually an abstraction of a asynchronous stream, right? Uh, and operators, uh, operators, they operate on observables. Okay. Uh, much like uh, you can concatenate two lists, right? Uh, just like that, you can concatenate two asynchronous streams. Okay. So that sounds interesting or intimidating for some reason, uh, for me as well. Uh, uh, so you can do operations on asynchronous streams. Uh, and single is nothing but a single value, which is, asynch uh, which is asynchronous. Okay. Um, so uh, a subject, again, we'll, we'll uh, talk about it later. Uh, again, scheduler also, it's slightly advanced. So I'm going to leave out the last two, last two or three. Yeah. So finally, I'm connecting all of them together. So we have reactive streams that came in 2013, the reactive extensions library that came in uh, 2011, uh, but then they have implemented the reactive streams spec. Okay, that's why it is relevant. Okay. And then uh, it is ported to Python. So that's where we get the library Rx, RxPy, right? Uh, so again, the links are there. Uh, uh, so uh, asynchronous processing is nothing new to Python. So if you have done GUI programming or 
network programming. We have, uh, you know, some way or the other used uh, asynchronous programming. You might have used coroutines. Uh, you know, there are many more. Uh, but all of them uh, have something missing, which is, uh, you know, given they can process asynchronous events. So there is an event, we can have an event handler and, uh, you know, we can register them and then, you know, things work. Uh, but they all have something missing, which is when you have streams, how do we manipulate those streams? Okay. I'll tell you what all we can do with streams. Okay. There are some interesting things we can do with streams. We can merge streams. We can, uh, we can concatenate streams. We can map streams. We can filter streams. And these are not uh, synchronous streams. These are asynchronous. That means these are values that we haven't expected or we haven't seen yet. So this is how you install this. Mm. So I talked about the observables uh, in the React extensions library. Uh, observables are nothing but streams of asynchronous events. Uh, don't worry if you are, if all of this is like, you know, to, there are some terms which you haven't heard before. Okay, I'm going to show you some diagrams afterwards. It, it, it'll be fun actually. And uh, so observables are also composable. Okay, so as I told you, asynchronous streams can be uh, merged, they can be concatenated, uh, you know, so they are composable. Um, so having these streams itself is not enough, right? So we have an abstraction for streams. We, we know how to represent these streams. The streams may be coming from mouse clicks. They may be coming from uh, uh, some Kafka, uh, you know, uh, queue or they may be coming from anywhere else. They may be web requests. They could be anything. Okay. Just that there is no fixed timing. They're all asynchronous. Okay. So we have an abstraction for that, but we need to do something with it. At the end of the day, we need to consume those streams, right? And, uh, you know, so we're going to do three things with that. Okay. One is on next. Every time a value comes from a stream or an item or a, a event or a message comes from a stream, we can do something with it. That's what this on next uh, function does. Uh, there is an on error function. Uh, when there is an error, when there is an exception, okay, uh, that on error function is used. Uh, and then there is when the stream completes, when it is done, when we close the application, GUI application, the stream is gone. So that's when this on complete uh, function is run. I'll tell you how these are run, uh, but all of them are implemented under an object called observer. Okay, uh, so an observer is the consumer. Okay, so observable is the stream and observe, observer consumes that stream. Okay, and it can do three things with that stream, on next, on error, on complete, right? So, uh, so this is how we use the React extensions library, uh, import it, we import some operators. We import the observer object. Uh, the main part is this, which is here I'm creating a, a asynchronous stream. It doesn't look so actually, right? This one is simply a range of members. Okay, but then uh, when I pass it through that particular method for iterable, it converts it into a, 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 a asynchronous stream or okay, observable. So that access is actually an observable. Okay, for simplicity, I'm actually using this, but the observable could be anything. It could be, it could abstract uh, a queue, it could abstract events in a game, it could abstract anything. Okay. For simplicity, I'm actually using this uh, iterable. Okay, and then I have my observer implemented on next, on error, and on complete. These are the three methods that I have implemented inside it. Uh, and then finally, I need to subscribe to that stream. Okay. Uh, so that access is the observable. Okay, on that I'm doing subscribe and then I'm passing my observer. Right? Um, so this is the output of that last line of code.
So as you can see, the end it, the stream completed, so it automatically called the on complete method. Okay. Now again, some of this may fly over your head. Don't worry. Okay, I'm going to show some. Uh, pardon? Okay. Uh, so that is uh, here. Yeah. So it is coming from here. The React X has uh, observer. Yeah, so here's another example, but much simplified here, okay. So the subscribe method earlier, it took an observer, okay, which has three methods inside it. And we said like based on failure or whatever it is, okay, the methods get called. Here we passed just one method, which is print one function. And that print is actually automatically taken as on next. So if you pass three functions here, they'll be taken as on next on error on complete, okay? So you need not always pass all the three on next, on failure, on error, on complete, okay? So any of them, you can pass any of them and it works fine. Okay, so. Again, uh, so this is the second thing, operators. Okay. Uh, you can, operator is like any other operator, like addition, subtraction sort of stuff. It takes an observable in and gives out an observable. So yeah, again, uh, operators can be composed. You can put one operator, you can take a observable, which is a asynchronous stream. You can do an operation on it. You get another observable, another asynchronous stream. You can put another operator on in front of it and then you can keep on doing that. They all compose, okay. Uh, so here is a simple example. Okay, I have these uh, members and I'm turning them into a asynchronous stream. Okay, uh, so here is my operator, which is filter. Okay, so these are all inbuilt operators that they come with React extensions. Uh, we can build our own operators, custom operators as well. Uh, so here the filter, what it does is, it, we pass it a function, a lambda function. Uh, so it, it takes every element and then it checks for this condition, if it is, uh, uh, is divisible by two or not. and uh, only those values which are even, those will be filtered. And finally, we are subscribing it. And then we are, uh, you know, uh, we are passing the print for the, as an on next uh, function. Okay. So if I don't do this part, uh, if I erase that subscribe part, it just works fine. Just that nothing happens. The stream remains like that. You know, there's a stream and then you apply an operator. What gets you, gets out, what comes out of it is another stream. Only when I attach an observer, that is when the stream gets consumed and what gets processed. Here, I'm using two operators. I'm just showing how you can compose operators. I have that stream, which is a sequence of numbers, one to 10 or zero to nine. And then uh, I am first applying filter and then I'm applying map. Okay, and to do that, I'm using the pipe uh, method. Okay, that's again, uh, is part of observe. Yeah, please. Pardon, I cannot. Um, latency, uh, see, these are asynchronous streams. So uh, latency is actually, uh, uh, unless we define it, uh, it's, uh, you know, because, no, here it is, the, it adds latency because uh, uh, the stream is simple, but if your stream is in a, yeah, yeah, a network request or anything like that, okay, it's very hard to predict latency or anything, right? But what it really shows is what we can do with streams, okay? Uh, imagine someone is uh, playing a game, they are uh, creating, clicking on a icon or clicking on a button, okay? Uh, and then, the, it's not clear when they will going to click, right? They're all, uh, you know, they're not equal, evenly timed. You know, they can happen, the clicks can happen anytime, okay? So, and then on top of that, we are applying these operators. Okay. Yes, yes, 
so uh, they are sequential first filter is uh, filter gets applied what you get out of it out of it is another observable okay and then uh, that is an input to the map so just a pipe function we use in linux okay um yeah so so here is another operator which is actually very interesting so earlier operators it took a stream and then it did something with it, it filtered or mapped okay transformed it into something here it is taking two streams two uh, uh, asynchronous streams and it is merging them can you predict what happens when you take two streams of mouse clicks and merge them or two streams of network requests merge them what happens any guesses uh, yeah they they get interleaved right just like git rebase uh, no so they get interleaved so basically whichever comes first that gets ta that takes the place in the timeline right and again if i leave out this subscribe it, it works just fine uh, just that the stream won't be processed won't be consumed Mm. So, uh, so here is a, so far, like, you know, it became very difficult for us to actually show a good example. Okay. So if you want to play out, play around with this uh, framework, uh, there is uh, a module named module uh, marbles. Okay. Here is how you can use it. Okay. You can create these simple strings, right? Uh, again, the syntax I have given out there. You can have ABC and uh, alphabets like that. Uh, hyphen represents 100 milliseconds. Okay, so if I add if I add multiple hyphens here, I'm actually interleaving two events. Okay, and then the the last bar means it's the stream is complete. If I add an X, that means it's there is an error. So you can uh, create these strings and you can actually try out, uh, you know, uh, simulate real uh, reactive stream. Uh, Asynchronous streams. So whatever examples I showed you, you can actually play around with this. Mm, yeah. So I'll just uh, quickly uh, give you a sense of uh, what asynchronous streams are. So what you see there is our timelines. Okay. Uh, so there are two streams. What I'm doing is I'm doing a merge operation on them. Okay. So you see how things get merged, right? So let me play around with that a little bit, okay? Let me move this here. You can see, right, how, how uh, the merge operation operates on these streams. So let me give you another example, concatenate. Okay, any guesses what is happening? There's first stream, second stream, What is concatenate doing? So it is laying out all the uh, events in the first stream, and then it is adding the streams. Uh, what happens if I move this, uh, the second two further? What happens? It is not affecting anything else, just that, right? Let me try uh, moving this one inside. Let me move this to back out of the. You can understand, right? What is happening? Clear? Is it clear? Any questions? Yeah. Oh, think about it. Think about it. You have two separate systems, or, or maybe you have two services, right? Uh, both are uh, two services uh, and two customer bases. You want to actually aggregate them, okay? But that's a live data that you are getting actually. Maybe purchases. You understand, right? Uh, purchases are coming from two services. Okay, purchase data. You would probably want to merge them and like. You know, uh, so what you get is final one stream, and then you can do some processing on that.
Uh, I, I didn't get your question. Can you merge? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that never happens actually. Yeah, yeah. In general, that never happens. That rarely happens. I, I don't know. At nano second scale, I don't think. So there is always some kind of ordering. So. Hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, you are correct. Yeah, so basically, uh, the order on the timeline, if you consider the, the final result, the timeline, the order on that will be the same. Just it's not just the order between themselves, but then uh, any any interesting okay, let's try zip. What happens? Sh shall I uh, increase the What happened? So there is one and a. Uh, so basically, it saw took one element from the first stream, one element from the second stream, and it put them together. That's a zip operation, right? Uh, what happens if I put all of them together here? This one, this one. Let me move this here. Still the same. The final result didn't change at all, right? Because it is taking one element from the first stream, one element from the second stream. You can see the the first stream has five elements. The second stream has only four elements, right? So it dropped the five. So because there is no matching pair for that. So there is one interesting one I want to show. So this is essentially what is happening when, when we use that React extensions library, this is essentially what is happening. Uh, you know, probably the code examples don't do that justice, but then you can get a sense of what is happening. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, zip, okay. I didn't get you. Uh, can you? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So basically, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it is blocked. So basically, uh, 
it would probably be buffered. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. It would definitely be buffered. Um, Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Yeah, but then the buffer size will be only one, right? Uh, or maybe no, it can it can increase if the first stream has more number of elements coming. It, it needs to buffer. It, it does buffer. Yeah. Uh huh. Correct, correct, yes, yes. So it remains to be seen, I mean, what happens if you have millions of such uh, you know, things in the buffer, like, you know, so there'll be buffer overflow and all. Uh, it's actually a good question. But then the, the interesting part is, we are able to do this, right? Uh, we are able to, uh, you know, do operations on two asynchronous streams. Uh, let's also look at this one thing. Okay, okay. So this is called buffer only. Okay, uh, can you guess what's happening here? Correct. Yeah. So uh, you have the second stream based on the second stream, whatever is the interleaving uh, time between this second stream, uh, whatever objects come, it is actually grouping them together. So let's play around with this. Let me move this C towards this. You see, it kind of, uh, okay. If I move the D to here, uh, or if I move the E to here, you can see what is happening, right? It's also an interesting operation. So there are actually use cases for all these operations, like uh, each domain has its own uh, thing. I haven't actually touched any of these operations. Yeah, so there is this uh, particular website. I added the link in the uh, presentation. So it's called, uh, these are called marble diagrams. So you can play around with reactive streams. So the power is not limited to just processing or manipulating two streams. You can have any number of streams and do that. I think uh, you know, someone is a front end developer, right? So they have an application for this as well. There is a RxJS. Okay. So uh, people use that in React and uh, other frameworks. So, so if you're building uh, games or anything in the front end, uh, it's actually very useful. I think I'm almost done. No one battery. How do you imagine the So these are two things that we didn't discuss yet. Okay. Uh, subjects is a, uh, it's an observable as well as an observer. Okay, so we can use it to uh, create streams or uh, act like a producer of 
asynchronous streams, but it can also consume streams. Uh, and then uh, go out and other schedulers are actually also interesting if you are working in some GUI framework or uh, any framework that has an event loop and all. Okay, so uh, there are execution schedulers. Uh, for example, most of the operations that I showed you, uh, because they are acting on reactive streams and they are composable, so they can be done concurrently. Okay, uh, but how do you execute them concurrently? It depends on the scheduler. So reactive streams supports having, uh, allows you to use schedulers of uh, other frameworks as well. Okay, so I think, uh, hmm. so I didn't talk about the back, back pressure. So I said like, it's all about, uh, you know, I started with reactive streams. Uh, so uh, if this part is there, then, you know, uh, life is all good. We could handle the, the earlier buffering problem, you know, uh, buffer overflow, all that stuff. So, uh, so basically, that is not added into the reactive extensions uh, till the earlier release. Uh, uh, RxPy version three, it was there, but then they removed it, uh, thinking that it's not part of the code framework. Uh, but these are additional things that you can add to the stream processing. Uh, you can add back pressure where you know if the consumer or the observer is unable to, uh, or the producer is producing too many uh, events, then you can apply one of these. There are many more actually. It's a actually an interesting domain. Uh, it's, uh, so these are some of them. The first one buffers basically if you have if the consumer is not able to consume uh, at the same rate as it's produced. So something can buffer in between. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Some things can be lost. Uh, say for example, you are trying to count number of views of a stream, be it a, there's a match going on, cricket match or something like that. You want to, you're getting a live stream of events, view connections, and then you want to count all of them, but then you are unable to keep up with that. So some, sometimes it's okay to drop to keep the system working. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can do other stuff as well. So. It's an interesting topic to explore, actually. Um, so the, there are various applications for using uh, streams. Uh, so you can go through this after the... Yeah, you can play with the uh, Rx marbles. Yeah, From, uh, uh, I cannot hear you. So. No, Iterable, yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, observable. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Actually, that is, the, that is actually the regular use case uh, where you take in a, a message broker or something and then you uh, uh, abstract it as a observable. Yeah. So, so basically, if you have a message broker, the library abstracts that message broker. Okay. So it's you think of it as a layer on top of the message broker. Uh, so uh, it's down to the message broker how it handles that. Okay. So if you are using Kafka, it persists those messages. Uh, and you can apply back pressure as well, if at all. Uh, you think the message broker doesn't support uh, buffering or persistence and all that stuff. Yeah, but these are things that even I have to look into. Yeah. You can explore. Hmm. Hmm. No. 
Yeah. No. So, job of message broker is to basically deliver the messages from point service A to service B. Okay. So this is a layer on top of it where. Uh, uh, so there are two messages coming from two salary queues. Okay, I want to merge these streams, or I want to do something filter or map. This is not something that salary does for us, or Kafka does for us. Right? That can connect uh, anytime. <laughs> Hello. Hello, hello.
Hello, everyone. Please join for the our next session. <coughs> so, um, what I would like to talk about today is the vector databases. I think, uh, how many of you are worked on the relational databases here? Okay, quite a few. So suddenly in last, you know, like maybe in one year or one and a half year back, I think this vector databases become a prominent in all of these, you know, like uh, unstructured data processing use cases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover, I think this is going to be very, high level because it, there is a lot to dive in if you go into the details, but it will give you an idea of what is this databases, what is the landscape, landscape of different vendors that they provide, and also what can you do with one of the simple, you know, like a, a demo kind of thing with Milvus, one of the open source uh, vector database, right? So there are two major things in that, similarity metrics and then indexing methods. That That's what we need to understand. And uh, some use case, where exactly in the use case that we use the vector databases, and there is a landscape and finally Milbus and then we'll demo. That is the agenda. Okay, so in traditional databases, I mean, why do we need a database first of all? In traditional you know, database, what is the reason for a database? Yeah, store and retrieve also, right? Once you store data, you have to retrieve it. How can you make retrieval faster in a traditional database? Index, right? You get an index. But in the, in the world of, you know, like vector database, traditionally you have either one field, right? A column with a numeric value as a float or integer or a string or a date, something like that. But in the vector database, we are trying to store the vectors as an input and then we want to work with the vectors, right? So we will come to the use case, but look at, there are a lot of different unstructured data, like you have images, text, audio, all of these things. And you want to store all this data so that you can retrieve it, whatever that you really want, you know, based on this, based on some metrics, similarity metrics. So if you look at it, you convert them into 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 embeddings. Embeddings is nothing but a is a vector with an you know like a with a dimension, like either 768, 1534. There are a lot of different dimensions are there. But what is converting into a vector? There is an embedding model in between. There is a model. If you go to Hugging Face, there are a lot of embedding models are available for you. Based on your use case that you are really working on, you can choose which is going to be more relevant for your use case. You take an embedding model, give a piece of information, either an image or a text or audio, it will convert that into a vector. Vector is nothing but, that's, that's what I told you, the single dimension where you have 768 dimensional vector or 1534, what are the vector that really comes in. And that vector, we are going to store it in the database. And um, we are going to retrieve this data again back whenever there is a need. That is what is the uh, typical case. But why this is really required is in the, in the world of unstructured data, you have a lot of this data and you want to search and then find the relevant information, right? So which is going to be difficult for you if you really use traditionally apart from relational databases, for text-based things, we are using a lot of, uh, you know, op open search, elastic search. These are the, you know, uh, things that people were using it. But that is also not a pure, you know, like a, uh, uh, a embedding-based, uh, you know, search. It is keyword-based search. You know, like if you find some of the keywords together with a proximity, you can get the results back. So that is the difference between a normal traditional database and vector databases. And then let us get into the next uh, piece of it. Yeah, I think. Uh, the important thing is if you really have a very less number of vectors, right? Let us take the vector indexes are not new. They've been there in the system. A lot of algorithms have been there for a while. But now the problem is with the scale. Now we are talking about millions and billions and trillions of, you know, like uh, vectors where I want to search. So always there is a problem. The problem is how fast I can search this. If you do a direct, if you take one vector, and try to compare the similarity with 1 million vectors, you know, like it'll take time across all of them, right? But you need something which can do it very fast. So you can go and 
try to find out something which is very fast. That's what is the reduce the time taken to really query this. That's an important piece. And also store all these millions and billions of things that is there. So, um, I mean, indexing and query techniques are the major. Okay, if you take two vectors and trying to find out whether they're similar or not, there are three things that we can really look at. Cosine similarity, dot product or inner product or Euclidean distance. So each one of them will give you a different type of measure. Okay, cosine similarity, the value varies from minus one to plus one. And uh, the dot product is minus infinity to plus infinity. And then the Euclidean distance will give it zero to infinity. So based on the value that you really get it, you can say whether it are similar or dissimilar kind of thing. That's what really happens. So these are the three metrics that you can really use it to find if given two vectors, whether they are going to be similar or not. Based on the value that you really get out of this comparison, you can compare and then say these two are similar or not similar. So this is one aspect. And the second aspect is going to be the vector indexing itself, right? Okay, vector indexing itself. So um, what is a, the, the similarly, if you look at you know traditional databases, you should you do a binary index, right? You take the values in you know, this one, try to segregate this, you take a number between 50, less than 50, greater than 50, within the 50, again, you say less than 25, you create a binary tree and then you do the indexing. But here, it's not going to really work that way because it's a series of, vectors, there are different ways of indexing these things. Um, again, there is a trade-off between accuracy versus time. Okay. I have 2 million vectors. I'll compare all of them and then see whether it is similar or not to all of them. It will take time, but you will get accurate result because you're comparing with all of them. But at the same time, I am okay to compromise on my accuracy, but I want results the fast because 2 million is still okay. If you give it top 10 results is still fine, but may not be 100% accurate in all the cases, right? So that is where what you do is there are algorithms, these indexes where you do it is you do in such a fashion where you only go and match against certain vectors in the database rather than the matching with all the vectors in the database. That's what happens here. So these class of algorithms are called approximate nearest neighbor, ANN. So there are different algorithms are there, but that is the fundamental name for, you know, like what kind of, if you're using ANN, it means that your results may not be 100% accurate, but it's going to be definitely fast. So that is the concept. Let's go. I think there are a lot of material here on the screen, but don't worry. I think you know, I've copy pasted a lot of the data. So, but don't worry about, you know, like whatever is there, but let us understand that flat index, flat indexing is nothing but it works very well for smaller data sets and you compare with against all of the vectors and then give the results. It will give you very accurate results, but it may not be very fast. Second thing is LSH, locality sensitive hashing. So what you do is there are hashing functions are there. You apply these hashing functions on that, you know, like vector and try to find out a bucket. Now you, you divide this whole data into certain number of buckets. And based on the hashing functions, you put all these data into different buckets, right? Now, when a new query comes in, somebody wants to say, you know, you have created this and new vector comes in. What you do is you take this vector, again, apply the same hashing functions, find out which is the nearest bucket that you can go and search in the bucket. So what it will do, it will not search across all of the vector data, but it will search in one or two buckets, wherever, you know, like relevant, and then give you the results from that. That is what is the LSH, you know, kind of indexing. Inverted file, you know, this is similar. This is similar to you know, like uh, the LSH uh, kind of thing, but here instead of creating the uh, the buckets, 
you create a lot of clusters. A lot of clusters means, again, this is all configurable. When you create the index, you create all these clusters. And the cluster centroids will be there. When the new vector comes in, you try to find out what are the closest to the cent these centroids. Now, if you create 1,000 clusters out of all these data, you have to compare first on the 1,000 clusters, find out 15 clusters which are going to be more relevant. Then in those clusters, whatever the vectors are there, you compare with them. So that way, that way you can really find out what is the similarity. Sorry, go ahead. No, how do you, when you say use case, no, I'm just trying to understand, a particular record means you want an exact match? Yeah. No, no, it is not, there is no ID here, but your whole information is embedded into a vector. So it's very difficult to say, you know, if even a small minor difference is there in the query, I'll come to the you know, use case. But you will not get the same vector. There is no way to really compare unless you compare these vectors across all of them, say, which is similar. So it's very difficult. It's not single value to really. That's an advantage in the traditional database. So a single value, I can always go and compare it, where something equals something. But here, there is no where. Even if you queue something, it's going to be difficult to compare because one or the other, you know, a floating, you know, variable will be different in the vector. It's not going to be seen. A very good point. So I told you the dimension of the vector, when you store, you can only store one dimension in the database altogether. If you say you are generating, so if you're using embedding model, you can use only one embedding model. There are multiple embedding models are there. You cannot say certain data, I will use this embedding model, other data, I use other embedding model. You have to use only one embedding model and it gives you a standard dimension of 768, 1534, whatever that is there. And you have to use that only. You can't mix and match the dimensions. And also another thing is, I mean, there are very rare cases of, you know, these sparse vectors where it's not completely filled. Some of them are blanks in between, right? You don't have values. So I don't think majority of them do support at this point of time. Uh, but there may be some, re, you know, like uh, time series data kind of thing might be required to really do it. But most of the text-based kind of when you do it, you don't get a sparse vector. You always get a dense vector. Sure. Can I consider? Can you say? Can you consider? If I get the cosine similarity between two vectors equal to one, yeah. Okay. Can I consider it's a like perfect match? Yeah. Both are same. Yeah. Then that that way we can figure out the uh, record that you are asking for. Right. Right. The similarity but, is like one. Yeah. Of course, we can say that. Yeah. Definitely. But to get that one similarity. How do you know which vector will get you that someone similarity, right? So there are millions of vectors in the database. Uh -huh. So how do you compare against all of them to find out? There is nothing like its value equals to something. So that is the reason you are you are having these algorithms to really figure it out. Okay, there could be a scenario where you may not even get that one, whichever even though it is in the database, okay. you may not get that one because you are using here is an approximate nearest neighbors. It means there is a chance that you may not get the exact result as what, you know. Uh, and also, you create a database, you create with certain parameters. For example, you index it with 1,000, you know, like uh, clusters. In another database, same information, you have 1,024 clusters. You may get a different result from both of them. You may not get the same result. So that's the reason it is always, you know, like approximate, I think. Okay. So you need to be always clear about the trade-off. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult. I mean, you cannot expect exact value in the, in the traditional relational databases. There is no doubt. You run the same query 100 times, you'll get the same result. There is no change in that. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is another one uh, HNSW. Actually, there is even Python library is there. If you want to run in memory, I think this library, you can use it. It's like you have multiple layers. It's like a graph based you know, kind of thing. There are multiple layers are there. In the top layer, you will have, you know, like uh, nodes apart. You know, basically, if the vectors are there, they're nodes apart. As you go to the lower lower level, they're connected. You know, like the lower level, you have the nodes very close to each other. So it means you start 
drilling down and point out to the nodes which are going to be relevant for you in your particular uh, case so i mean i mean i don't want to get into a lot of details but that is a very high level if you look at this is a multi layer you know like a, a multi layer and is a graph kind of algorithm where you start with the top layer find out the node the closest nodes for you and then as you really drill down and then go on only pick those nodes which are relevant for you and then do the similarity search on top of it <clears throat> Okay, so interesting is the use case, right? I mean, if you now go on anywhere, like either Google or Twitter, any social platform, RAG has been retrieval augment generation is the bigger use case for this kind of thing. There are other use cases are there, but this is the one of the major use case. So you have an LLM, right? LLM is large language model, like chat GPT. You know, there are, now actually every day there is one more new model is really coming up in the market. But what is LLM? LLM can give you the world's knowledge. If I ask a question to you, it will tell you, you know, based on what are the knowledge you learned from all these corpus, it will tell you the answer. But majority of the enterprises, they have their own data. And the context also keeps changing, right? It means that yesterday and today, there is more information has been generated. Now, if I want a specific answer to my, you know, documents or my data, how do I really get the answer? But using the LLMs, that was one of the use case. So what you do is, you take all the documents, your data, what are the documents, either it is, you know, like a confluence or, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever the document that you have taken, you take all the documents, relevant documents, where you want to get the answers from those documents, you chunk them, chunk them means you, you can always, you cannot embed the whole document, I think the searchability is going to be lost. So you chunk them into smaller pieces, 2000 characters, 1500 characters, whatever the use case, but these are all not going to be easy to really define, you have to look at your data and then decide. Once you create the chunks, that chunks you give it to the any embedding model. And then the generate the embeddings, you store them in the vector database. That's a one flow of this. So now the user comes in and asks, ask, saying that, you know, like, uh, uh, what is the price of certain security? I'm just giving some example. What is the price of security? Or what is operating income, you know, for this particular company during 2023? Or, uh, what are the year, you know? That question, it will take it. And it will go back and create the same embedding model. It creates the embeddings, vector embedding. Go and try and search in the vector database. You find relevant chunks. So these are the relevant chunks. It may not be one. You may get 5, 10, 20 based on your use case, based on the capacity of LLM, or how much you know, like context it can really take. You take those chunks, put into your prompt, and give it to the LLM. Prompt is an instruction to the LLM saying that what is the task to be performed by the LLM, right? Now, once you give it, you get the answer. Okay, this is the use typical use case question and answer if you want to answer using the LLM for your own data, you can apply this. There are a lot, lot many variables are there here. So one is embedding model that you really use. It depends the quality of the answer. And uh, the vector database, the algorithm indexing that you're using, it depends, the, the, the like answer will depend. And also the way that you write the prompt and also the LLM that you're using it. If you use probably you know, open AI, chart GPT and all, you will get a better answer than another open source model. Okay. There are a lot many variables are there, but you have to decide what is required for your use case and then you can, you can build the solution. Thank you. Uh, but usually when you uh, read about these things, there's like fine tuning of the model. So the model is there and then you add data and then a uh, sort of a retraining happens with that data. Here, I don't see that step, right? You are just retrieving information from the database and pushing it to the same model in real time. Is that uh, yeah. correct? So in this particular case, this is called as a pre-trained model. I think whatever is on the shelf, this is also model is again, there are multiple layers of this model. Somebody builds the, just, you know, like a sequence prediction model first thing. And then people take that, they have taken a lot of other data, build the chart models on top of it. This is one of the chart models that we're really talking about it. But now, if you want, for your use case, if this is not working for some reason, right? Some searching and all, it's still fine. I think it really works. But if your use case is a content generation, where you're generating a content for which it's not seen, the LLM is not seen, probably there may be a need for you to fine tune the model. But it is not always required that you should fine tune the model for your use case. It depends on what kind of use case that you're really working on. 
I mean, in our own you know, like case, we, we are working on some description generators. For that, the model was not able to do it. It was always giving hallucination. It means it will try to guess something and then give an answer, which may not be right. But we wanted to give an import of our company's knowledge onto that model, then you do the fine tuning. But otherwise, you don't need to do the fine tuning at all for those models. But that is depends on your use case again. Sorry? No, no, no. It is not fine tuning the model. There is no fine tuning in. Fine tuning is you take this LLM and then you give, you know, like you go and change the LLM, you know, the, like some of the, you know, like uh, weights itself that you really won't change the weights. You generate another model on top of this model. It is not the same model. But this is like, what are the off the shelf? If you go to Hugging Face, you will find all of these llamas and falcons of the world. You can take any one of the model and use it as it is. Yeah. So just to follow up, you gave the example of using the company confluence or any other material that's available and making that searchable. What you're suggesting here is that can still be done without the need of fine tuning the model, just using this work. Exactly. Because the important thing is you're providing a context to your LLM. See, when you get these chunks here, you go back and tell instruct your LLM to answer only from this context. Don't use your, you know, like your own knowledge and all of them. Use this con context, whatever I provided. From that context, you answer the question. Don't use any other knowledge. But still, it can hallucinate. That is a different question. Yep. Uh, the chances of hallucination is going to be much lesser here. Sure. What chunking uh, strategies have worked out for you? Like, uh, like you chunk, create, create chunks out of a uh, documents, right? Like, what chunking strategies have you used? I mean, generally, there are. I think one of the major thing is data processing itself is a big deal than you know, like creating all these things, right? Yeah. So, whatever that we have used in our use case, 1,500 to 2,000 characters has worked well, with an overlap. Yeah. You just give an overlap of you know, like a. I mean, this is again based on your document structure, how your documents are structured. Unless you look at them, you cannot say the same chunking strategies work for you also. Okay. Like what data have you used? Is it PDF document or? A like let's say we have a PDF document of say page 20. So like, do you have any idea of like what might be the better uh, checking strategies yeah, for that? The way that at least I have approached is like this. First of all, documents could be a 200 page PDF document yeah, or it could be a single two page document, right? Mm -hmm. And also there could be a lot of different paragraph lengths and whatever. So we need to analyze a little bit of saying that, how do you keep the context when you're really checking that, right? If I take my paragraphs are always, you know, like most of them, maybe 80% of my paragraphs are of length between 1000 to 2000, something like that. Then you can use that as a chunking strategy. But you need to analyze the data before you say, this is going to work for you or not. I mean, unfortunately, I'm sorry, there is no straightforward answer saying that you do this, it will work. Okay, okay. So, but you need to analyze the data based on your data. And you know, like how much you can really parse or extract the data from your PDFs, then you can go back and create the chunking strategy. Okay. But this is a very difficult question. I think all the meetings, whenever you present something, we'll get the same question saying that what chunking, how do you really going to do it? Is it really going to work? Why can't you take this one? This will keep coming up. So thank you. Okay. So sorry, I'll go ahead. I'll have a question before that, you know. So the question that he asked uh, recently, I worked with a PDF, you know. Uh, where it has like uh, more than 40, 45 pages. Okay. So what approach we followed is like, you know, we divided the text into chunks. Okay. But you know, in the prompt, we said that, you know, uh, take one chunk. Okay. Summarize it into like one or two lines. Okay. Without using the, without using the context. Okay. And you know, other time of Nick, other for the next time, give that, uh, summarization along with a new paragraph and again, summarize it, but it will be like long process. Uh, it will require a lot of calls as well. But yeah, without losing the context, that's how we can do. Okay. Yeah. This is one approach we did. And one question here, yeah. uh, the previous yeah. slide that you showed, mm -hmm. is it like, you know, knowledge graph or fine tuning? The previous no, it's not a knowledge graph. Not knowledge it is graph. not knowledge graph. Knowledge graph is completely different. So okay. this is only a rag solution where we are trying to say for the LLM, we have to provide a context. How do you provide that context to the LLM is what we are trying to do. That's all. So we are not, knowledge graph is completely different up solution and different approach. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically there are two uh, 
frameworks or libraries are there lang chain and then you know like you have you know lang is one more lang talk is there but lang chain and uh, lama index right these two are the libraries and every day there is a release that they are really making and then adding a little bit more on these different type of things that you can do it how to make it more efficient or different use cases so if you go back and look at them i think there are so many examples or so many ways that you can implement the rag there is not not one solution there are multiple solutions are there but okay let us quickly look at this you know landscape of the different vector databases right you have in the text search kind of area open search analysis tech everybody is getting into the bandwagon bandwagon and they are also trying to make their databases vector search right now right open search even uh, they have implemented now it's like earlier it was not there but recently they have started these are the some of the pine cone milvas they are pure vector databases they don't really you know like combine different features their databases are only pure vector databases milvas is the open source but they have a commercial solutions also pine cone is completely commercial and they also say that they have their own proprietary algorithms for indexing and searching and all of that and uh, vv8 again is a chroma the lap, the top one is there like chroma and then the last one is vv8 i think these are all some of the databases but again you may not get the same result even if you you know like same data different vector data store you will get a different type of results i think that you need to keep in mind and redis and mongodb document source they have also implemented along with there similarly pg vector recently they announced and then i think you might not know but oracle there is a private preview that they have already working on it i think they gave a demo to us but i think it might come very soon that oracle also will be you know like giving the vector database so and uh, the libraries like fires and all of them they are they are only in memory vector stores right you can take the data store it in memory and do something but they may not work beyond certain point of time unless your compute is too much okay so milvas uh, just a little bit of high level introduction of this milvas i think is 201 and something has been created but primarily the reason of milvas is to address the trillion scale right you have billions and trillions of vectors that you want to index and search and then they do the scalability of this one so let us quickly look at how this whole thing works but again let's not get into a lot of these details of this one the underlying is the object store what they really do is they store everything into the files you know like you put all this into the files and then store the files their metadata is stored in the meta storage in the top right so what it means is when you come a particular place which file to really go and get this data has been there in that file kind of thing and you have this uh, query nodes data nodes and index nodes all these different nodes are there to serve the search query when you give a query you want to first you go and you know hit the index node to find out what are the indexes that are really required based on indexes you go and search the data and you have to load this data back into the memory also you may not be able to load all the data into the memory that's what it has to churn that right i think all these things are the controller all of them will take care of all these kind of things so this is a very high level architecture of and there is a proxies here which means for you if you want to scale you can increase this query and data nodes as many as possible that you really want to do it and then the user will only work through that proxies you don't have to really directly interact with any of these nodes underlying nodes and all of that so if you want to try it out there is a docker uh, you know uh, compass file is there you can directly go and bring up all the instances together and then work on it for poc purpose not for the real production but real production they don't have any solution i mean you can build on your own but you need a lot of expertise to really build it but they have their cloud based you know it's not on prem they their cloud it is a saas offering you can go and work on it okay so i mean i'll i don't know how much time we have so maybe for 10 minutes i will complete it so this uh, i'll just quickly show you i mean it's a python meetup so what is the code that we really want to use to really you know how to create this database and how do we really go on things like that so you create the document chunks embeddings for those chunks and then uh, create a collection collection is nothing but like a table you know whatever you can call in the other things and insert the data into the collection and then index the data these are all the steps that is required before you start searching and then load the data into the memory because i mean the small data that we are using it but still you need some data to be loaded into the memory before you start searching and then finally you search for similarity based on what are the index what are the similarity metrics and then you can give a query string and then search for it okay so um i already have a notebook
I'll just quickly go through. Um, I mean, five milvers is a you know like library that gives you. I think I'll be able to see it, or is still going to increase the fund. Yeah, that is the right measure of metric. That if he says yes, it's okay. But the front one is okay. Good. So, a uh, five milvers is the you know like a uh, you know like library that we can use it to interact with the Mil milvers database. What I would have taken is I have taken a news articles, some Kaggle data set. I have taken the news articles and then trying to go insert this data and index them and then try to see if we can get the similar uh, uh, documents out of it. So this is the data. You have article and date what is there, generally header, whatever for this article, and then the type of the article like business, news, I mean business, sports, something like that will be there with all these things. So I have created a Milvus, uh, I mean like uh, instance here. This is a cloud-based, I know, I mean, I could not do, man. unfortunately, my Docker is not, you know, working in my laptop. So I have to create a one in the Milvus, uh, this one. They give you some 100 credits. I think there is there. You say that it will there another 27 more days for me. And you can just simple insert and you can do all the stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and if you look at here, this is the cluster I have. And this cluster has, uh, there is an articles collection. And this is the schema. Schema in any database, like what are the fields and you know what data type it is and all of them. So you you have you can you have to define a primary key here. Actually, primary key is required if you're going to update the records and all of them. And one of the field article vector is the ve float vector. This is the type we, where we are going to store our uh, all the vectors of dimension 768. And you have all others are the var characters, like you can define. Up to 65,000, some limit is there on the wire car. You can go up to that limit. Okay, so going back here, um, this is the way you can connect to that. You know, I mean, this is a little different, but if you're one this host and port, you can really connect without passwords and all of them. But there's a token is required here. And then, uh, anyhow, I'm using Langchain to process the chunks, right? So you, you look at here, there is a text splitter, which is like chunk size of 2000, chunk overlap of 20 characters, and then length function is length, I think that's okay. So what it will do is it will take a chunk of data, it will create chunks of data based on this, you know, this uh, parameters. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking all the articles and whatever is there, I am trying to, you know, like uh, chunk them and also adding some metadata to it. Actually, these documents, if you directly integrate with Langchain, you can directly load it. You don't have to do any, you know, intermediate things. But what I'm doing is I'm adding the, to the document what is the date, heading, news type, and article ID for my reference, you know, so that which article is the reference that I've taken it. So it will create the chunks of these things into this one. So there are around uh, 3,000 odd chunks are there. If you look at this is what you will see as a, you know, document. The page content, I'm really sorry, I think this is, very small, I can see from here, but date, metadata, date, you know, uh, the heading and the, and what are the type of that news type. Okay, so I have used the hugging face embeddings. This is a lang chain, and then this is a sentence transformers. But if you go to uh, hugging face and find out, there are a lot many, you know, uh, models are available. I think the important point is, this will take generating embeddings will take more time than loading and other things because this embedding generation based on the model that you're using it will need a lot of resources if you have a gpu resources it will be much faster if you're using uh, deep learning models but if cpu it might take a lot of time in my case i think it took around 28 minutes for 3000 in my laptop so and then you create all the document embeddings and 3,000, uh, not articles, dead chunks. Yeah. So now you create a collection. I mean, this is a, this basically what I'm doing. I'm defining the schema here. It is already created there, but I'm defining the schema like what data type, article ID, data type is integer, you know, like is primary true. This is what is the primary key. All these things I'm defining it. Once I define it, I create a schema using these fields and description and then enable dynamic field is true. Basically enable dynamic field true is true is like in future, you don't have to define them. You can directly add by loading the data also is possible if you do that. 
and then this is the collection you create the collection and now like in in if you do the sql if you insert data into a table if you just put all the values it expects in the same order in which you are defined in the table similarly here also you have defined all these things i am taking all those things as a different lists and then loading the data back into uh, into milvas so this is the collection i think all these are the different lists of data article ids 3000 headings 3000 text 3000 you know like dates 3000 news types and all of that and finally the document embeddings right and then say so you say insert collection dot immerse data i mean this will retrieve the collection from the uh, database and then it will insert all the data the flush is required in generally it will keep don't write into the file still you really say this flush i think once is a flush it will write into the files and all if you look at here this is the index parameters what i'm defining right i'm defining cosine similarity and i'm doing ivf flat so inverted you know that file flat index is that that is what i'm defining and this is one of the parameter because it has to create some nodes it will say 1024 nodes is what it's going to really create that is a this is a modifiable parameter and then you can modify based on your need and once you define the parameters i give the you know field name basically which field i am going to create the index and then index parameters it will create the index and uh, now i have inserted i have created the index and inserted the data and created the index now you have to load this into memory if you say load it will try to load this data into memory and keep it for you when you do this operations it's going to be faster i mean as i mentioned if the data is huge it will do all those things of going back to the disk taking what is relevant for you to put into the memory and all of them that will do but your search might be slower if you have less memory but more data so obviously you have to go on you know come you know like uh, work on those uh, parameters okay now this is the index when i created i have to use the similar parameters while querying also i cannot use the different parameters i am using the same cosine similarity and then uh, i mean maximum i think i want 10 results out of this like top top 10 results kind of thing here and if you look at i want to find out us oil prices you know something like that us oil prices or us you can find different things i can go and say i want only the articles where us oil prices are going down or going up or whatever right i have given last one here is us oil price dropped and i'm using the same embedding model here and if you go to the collection and search for it i give this data this is the embedding query that i am giving it what are the embedding that i generated from this and it will give me you know limit is 10 this is all okay and then what is the output fulls i am required and consistency level is strong so i think that's fine so if i go and execute this i'll get all these matches okay so i have i have uh, run these matches and i have put them into the file here so look at what do we have here it's like if you look at these are oops okay the petrol prices hike it by something petrol prices likely to see a major hike i mean it is similar articles it has really brought up for you saying that i am using us you know uh, oil prices increased or whatever so it has brought up similar articles but again i mean this works but as i mentioned you need to look at lot of different things like type of metric that you use it type of index that you really use it and then embedding model that you use it the results will depend on all these things no no, no. sorry sorry i think uh, uh, i mean uh, i was i was running different queries for different things but the same variable right the last one is what is taken it it is not i mean i just kept it what kind of queries that i have already run it here that's all so yeah so i mean this is a at a very very high level that you know what is a, what are the vector databases and how you can make use of it and how we can really work on it so i think that's all i have thanks a lot sir i think we'll take a couple of questions because uh, we are running a bit so in the in the second query when you say uh since july it is searching for uh since july in the title right not time exactly and there is nothing like that but what is exactly happening is probably if 
let us take in july if there are 10 articles published you will get all the 10 articles whatever is there published in july because it look for a similarity right it's not that there is no meaning here meaning means the semantic meaning is there but it's not exactly look for july only it could be on august also you might get the articles july there was nothing there only august and september they published the articles you will get those are the closest matches okay but if you look at here you look at this metric that really comes here right the distance metric this this might vary based on the match percentage whatever is there this is the cosine similarity 0 0.7 means probably it is not that exact match but it matched to some extent right but if it is 0 0.9 0 0.9 or something like that it is a very closest match kind of thing okay. Okay, I guess we are good. And one more thing, sorry, I think here I am matching with the article text, not with the heading. So let us not get confused because the heading can generally heading is related to the articles, you know, like uh, this one. That's why I know what is article here, but the matching is done again as the article text. Probably we could do even another index create, you know, with the article heading first and then find the relevant headings before you go to the things but it all depends on what kind of input you are giving it if i'm giving a more descriptive text then it really works so yeah i mean one of the major concern is the llm's context window right i cannot give you 8000 characters because some of the open source llms can take you up to 4k so you can't give you more context but if you are using amazon bedrock they have a cloud which is uh, what one lakh tokens so you can go and give full three documents continuous as a you know like whole this one and do it but I, I'm not sure if you try to embed the whole document as an embedding text and then search for it, how the accuracy of the results are going to be. Uh, but they claim it's really good and it is, it really, you know, works well, but I'm not really sure about what this is. Cloud. Okay, thank you, sir, for the awesome talk. Uh, next we have Abhijit. Hello.
Hello. You can hear me, right? No, no boy go. Everything all right. Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, you would have seen me running around. I I work at Gojek, so that's what I have helped organize this. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, database reliability. It's a bit different. It's not the conventional Python related, Python core Python stuff, which we really talked about at Bank Pipers. But why I chose Bank Pipers for this was that because Patroni, which is which helped us uh, improve the database reliability at Gojek, is written in Python. So I'll do a deep dive into how, how it works and everything. So let's go into it. A bit about me. So I work at, I have been working at Gojek for the past four years. I've been helping building the developer platforms and the cloud platforms. Uh, currently I'm working with a database as a service team, which is, yeah, we take care of managing and abstracting out all the databases like Patroni clusters, PostgreSQL, Redis, Redis clusters, Sentinels, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, all that stuff to the developers so that developers don't have to worry about that. They just can, do two, three clicks and they can, the databases are up and they don't need to worry about anything at all. So that is what I have been doing for the past year or so. When I'm not working, I I make music, I play guitar and I sing for a while and I work out my home, I have a gym. So yeah, I will talk about the agenda. First, I'll set context on uh, how how much the scale is right for, to understand how much the databases affect the systems you need to understand how much scale you're working with and what is the microservices architecture we are following and how much uh, it it's important right so and then we will discuss how the databases and reliability come into picture so that to, just to build a plot why it's important and uh, how we can solve it or the problems we are facing and how we get to solve it for patroni and uh, we will talk a bit about Patroni, how it is, what it is, uh, what goes behind the scenes, what helps, what makes the Postgres normal databases systems highly available to help a PostgreSQL, uh, sorry, to help a Patroni and increasing the availability of the systems. Uh, apart from that, we'll do a deep dive into Patroni, how it works behind the scenes, what are, what are the workflows which are present, what are the loops which are present, and how it uh, observes the post-GSQL process and makes sure that it's highly available all the time. Uh, a few more things I'll talk about at the end is that uh, I'll share the lessons and experiences from managing Patroni clusters on production for a country level scale uh, for Gojek, so that's what I presented as well. So just to set a bit of a scale, we have around like, I don't know how many teams, so many teams, and we are around six, 700 microservices. And like each of them have, when I'm talking about databases, I'm talking strictly about PostgreSQL here. So uh, around 400 or so have databases in them. So you, they are around all the microservices are talking to each other. It's a intertwined architecture in which most of the microservices are uh, connecting to each other and are dependent on them. So like you can think about, uh, I'll give a brief intro on what Gojek is because a lot of people might not be aware. So Gojek is a super app platform in the Southeast Asia. So you would see with Zomato, Swiggy here in India, Uber, Ola, uh, Porter and everything, right? Swiggy, Instamart. It's all of those apps in one app. So it's like a super app with all of these different utilities and everything in one single app, right? So that's what the main part is that because there are so many diverse use cases, you need we need to make sure that all the microservices are talking to each other. Like there will be more microservices for just to profiles, just to, for the user profiles, one microservice for 
allocating the drivers to the to their jobs, to their bookings, basically. One for food, one for transport, one for logistics, and could be so many. So there are multiple teams for that as well. And our job to maintain the reliability of the databases is to maintain the reliability of all the databases. I'll talk about that as well. Um, yeah, so the point is that it's a bit difficult to pin down the scale of the databases we are dealing with by when you have so many microservices, right? So we would... Uh, Talk about one of the service, which is the allocation service in which, which assigns the bookings to the drivers. Because most of our core workflow, which is transport, like booking a cab, getting an order, food order, like any grocery order or whatever, could be boiled down to the allocation service, which uh, allocates the driver to the bookings, right? So we will take a look at the scale of the database, which is, this is just the, queries per second on the PostgreSQL database of the allocation service, which is around like 600K requests per minute, and it generates around 12,000 walls per hour. So walls is the right ahead logs. It is just a, basically a transaction log, and it generates around five, five walls, which are size 16 MBs each per second, which is a lot of volume. If you have not been working with databases, you will tell that it if a normal database would generate around like 15, 20, 100, walls in a day that that's also going to be high volume but this is ultra volume this is the largest volume i have ever seen so that's scale we've been working on apart from that for that same database you will have like 18 80 19 billion inserts per month and around 100 billion uh in uh, fetches so that requires the database to be up if the database goes down then your entire gojek workflow goes down and you cannot avoid that because that will incur extreme business losses. So the reliability is extremely important. Mike, the question is that will a conventional uh, PostgreSQL system be able to handle such a load? I'm too far good. I think. Yeah. Am I? Yeah. Am I good? Yeah. So the thing is that will a conventional uh, PostgreSQL system like just a master slave system, which we have, right? Because Gojek all has worked from the ground up. And the thing is that we believe in a normal application in PostgreSQL, which will scale. This is not a comment on how PostgreSQL itself would scale on a country level, but a question on the uh, architecture of it. Let's say if one of the VM goes down, what happens? So that, that's the question. Will it be able to support a country level scale? Uh, so let's discuss a few cases why it won't and why what are the challenges which you could which anyone would could face facing such a scale on that level is that let's see a normal very normal application database system where your api traffic is coming from a load balancer to the application server load it could be a django app it could be a fast app it could be a rails app and it's talking to the uh, master database and master database is, is replicating to the replicas so just one master, two asynchronous replicas or synchronous replicas. Let's say there's two asynchronous replicas which are streaming the right ahead logs or the walls to the uh, replicas from the master. Everything goes well. What happens is that if the DB goes down, if the master goes down at this current moment, uh, I will explain why it goes down. So if, if the master goes down at any level, any point of time, what would happen is the app would go down, right? And the replication would stop, but that would still mean that the data is still present in one of those replicas. If the data is present, you can redeploy your application, point to the new database, promote it as a master. That will take 30 minutes. 30 minutes is a huge time. You would have 50 people on the call, and everyone really would be on your heads that what's happening here. So that's that's a very stressful situation. If you would, you, no one would want that to happen, right? And we all use cloud providers, and this is bound to happen because we are using VMs. You are aware that it's not a whole complete bare, bare metal system that you would be able to uh, not be able to uh, be escape from the noisy neighbors problem or like uh, from the others other systems in the data center. So, like Google, one of the cloud providers, I won't name the cloud provider because I don't want to. Uh, provides the uptime for a normal compute uh, for around 99.9%, .9%, which is around eight hours, which is guarantees a less downtime than eight hours, 40 minutes, one minute, which is a lot of time. But the point is that we, in the uh, architecture before, we had created the 
replicas in different zones, so which is still around 52 minutes of downtime per year. That's the level at which the SLA of the cloud provider is. So this is the max, this is the minimum, this is the max they will go to. If you go beyond this, they will give you some financial credits and everything, but that doesn't incur the losses you would face, right? So you, we, need, we need to get out of this because it might be that around from zero to 15 minutes, two minutes of downtime, your application could go down, right? So even an hour of downtime in one year is a huge loss for the company. So how would you, you can correlate by this that the application downtime is approximately equal to the database downtime because the database goes down, the app goes down. Uh, yeah. So what we wanted is that a target of a, around uh, three nines, I mean five nines of uptime, less than five minutes of downtime, which is very much achievable with today's systems. But as you scale up from the ground up, you have just one Postgres node running, serving all the traffic. This is a bit daunting. So yeah, let's discuss how uh, and why this is important. So before that, I'll discuss a few more cases why the conventional PostgreSQL system does not scale up for a country level scale. This is a scenario where the DB would have gone down. You would have deployed your app uh, to point to the new master. You will promote a replica, make it a new master and point your application to the new master. What happens is that you would not know at any point of time there might be a possibility in the incident call that uh, one of those applications or one of those workloads were pointing to the old master as well. So this causes a split brain scenario. A split brain scenario is when two instances of the same database split and they diverge from their own timelines. So the red, red master would be on a different timeline. The green master would be on a different timeline. So after the host error had happened on the, one of the nodes earlier, it would have restarted and have become a master again. So which you have two, two masters for the same cluster. That is a very common thing which has happened and it's, it's, it's a pain to debug this. It's, it's horrible. So we, I remember that we had a very high throughput system and this happened and we had to debug it and then figure out what data is where and then quick out the data which was in the new, in the old master and pick it back to the new master, which is very difficult in PostgreSQL because for high, for less throughput system is all right. For high throughput system is the pain. And your database becomes irrecoverable and your data becomes inconsistent to a point where there's no coming back. So this messes up the whole database and you have to then restore from your backup and everything. So that takes a lot of time, right? And the point is that the actual business loss to this would be that your might be that you're ordering something. The order is gone. Where is the order? You would then that that causes a lot of bad reviews. So the, everything is related, right? One uh, half an hour of downtime would cause like hundred thousand one star reviews on your app, which is which is the actual metric people are tracking, right? So that is something how the database reliability goes down to the application success to the business success as well. Uh, one more thing, uh, I'll just point out to the issue with the normal conventional system is that you would have created a new master and there's no concept of a global configuration in PostgreSQL. Let's say you have three, four nodes in a cluster. You can define the shared buffers like, uh, so she was talking about the, no, sorry. the first talk you was talking about the buffers. Uh, so the thing that is that you need to make sure the buffers are suited to the traffic. Uh, normal recommendation is that the buffers should be around 25% of the RAM and the cache should be around 50% of the RAM. But if that's not the case, your database performance will go down. So latency will increase and your orders will take more time. So in this case, what would happen is that in case of a misconfigured, newly promoted master, uh, uh, your application will start to stop. Let's increase the latency and your orders will start to increase. So that's not the case. One of the that's the thing is that allocation service or whatever service is being called by multiple order management systems, right? The order management systems will start to time out. Drivers will not be allocated, orders will be failing, and everything goes down, right? So that's a thing which comes in the picture as well. And that's the point to make sure that this is not the case. You need to make sure is that uh, too much manual process to make sure that the configuration is same everywhere and it's just a lot of pain. It's, it's okay to do it on one question. Do you have a question? 
Yeah. Uh, this is not the yeah that could be one of the one of the things but in a cloud system what happens is that one of the data one of the nodes will randomly go down i explained earlier that if, if it would give you a 99.99 percent of uptime which means that it can go down for 50 minutes in a whole year right go down the vm goes down the vm itself goes down not a data it's not a question on the database going down the vm itself goes down if the vm itself goes down the process goes down right then the database would become un unresponsive. So that that is the thing. Apart from that, uh, that can also be the case when the DB gets too uh, cluttered up and too heavy load that it gets restarted. That's also is a good possibility. That happens. So in that case as well, you would need a beefed up box, a beefed up replica to so fail over to. I'll explain that later as well. No, no. Um, there would be only one master at a point. In relational databases, in, in normal MongoDB or uh, column-based databases, you could have, could have multiple masters, like Redis could have multiple masters, but PostgreSQL, you would want only one master. Because I explained earlier, you would not want two masters and diverse from the timeline. That's very important for the uh, integrity of the data. So you would have one master. I'll just go back to this, yeah. So you will see that it's all the apps are writing in one node, and that node is replicating the data to all the replicas. So that no, that master node is responsible for replicating the data to the, all the nodes, not the data application writing to both the replica as well as the master as well. Yes, master is a source node. That's correct. With distributed systems now it's leader now it's, we call it leader replica uh, master slave used to be a earlier thing but now it's all leader replica and everything so so for all these questions uh, there are a few more things which we'll discuss about why postgresql is not that good of an option PostgreSQL itself as an entity is amazing to scale. We have had a lot of sources written for PostgreSQL. That scales very well. But the system behind which how it's architected, that's the problem. So that's where we'll discuss how Patoni solves it. Uh, Patoni is an open source repo, open source library written in Python. And it's actively maintained by Zalando, which is a European, uh, I think, fashion brand. So they maintain that uh, library for a long time. And we have worked on contributing a few things on that as well. Apart from that, it uh, converts Postgres system into highly available, gives you five, six nights of uptime, and then makes it fault tolerant so that you would not face an issue like I described before, make it disaster ready in case one of the zones go down. Let's say there are three data, three, three data centers in Taiwan. So you know, one, if one of the whole zone goes down, there was an incident in Paris, I think, uh, a year ago, when the data center was flooded, and the whole data center went down because all your data went down. There was an issue with the GCP uh, region. So the whole region went down. So you would not be able to recover from that, right? So that is also something you need to take in mind and how Patroni helps to that as well. I'll explain how. So this is, I think, is it is it clear to see from there? You, the, the small text might be a bit blurry, right? Okay, I'll explain it, no worries. So. This is how a normal Patroni cluster with an application interaction looks like. It's it's similar to it. You would have a load balancer in front of the three nodes earlier. You would have reader, replica, and master. Now you still have a reader, replica, and master, but there would be a load balancer in front of it, and the Pat Patroni agent would be running on each of the nodes. So for each one of the nodes, Patroni would manage and observe the PostgreSQL process. So it's like a controller over the PostgreSQL process and manager observes its behavior. In case if it goes down, Patroni acts upon it and uh, it 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 have it has REST APIs so that for the load balancer to know that which is the leader at the current point. Let's say the leader is the red one, it would react give a 200 for the slash leader API, and the others would give slash. 200 for a slash read or slash async API, whatever. So the point is that the load balancer would know at any point of time 
which is the master. So in case of a failover, I'll explain how the failover process works as well. Uh, the load balancer would know where to point and it would point to the uh, leader as well. So here's one more thing is that there's a concept of leader election in distributed services because you would want to have the leader to the running post skill skill process at any point of time. So that is where the distributed consensus comes in and it takes care of uh, electing the leader in case of your leader going down. So I'll explain the high level flow as well. So yeah, yeah. This is a distributed consensus store. So it takes care of uh, keeping sync of your process, knowing that which of the con uh, process is up. So let's say if your leader, I'll explain that in detail here, is if, if your process leader, leader process goes down, right? DCS is responsible. DCS here in reference is console. We, we have been using console for DCS. So DCS itself would be responsible for knowing which is the leader, which is the replica and which is the other nodes basically. So in case of uh, node node going down, let's say the PostgreSQL, uh, the leader node went down, right? What would happen is high level, this process looks like this. The DCS would tell that I am not working anymore. But Tony would tell the DCS that I'm not working anymore. Please do something. And the DCS will ask the main DCS cluster to remove the leader lock, that remove the leader lock for this particular cluster on the leader node, which has gone down. Now the DCS cluster will trigger a leader election and it will start a leader election on the remaining candidates, which are the replicas. In that sense, what the next thing would happen via a set of steps, which I'll explain later in very detail, is that it chooses a new leader and the right traffic will start flowing to the new leader. So that this process takes around very less than one, less than one second. So if the leader went down, the load balancer would know immediately that it has went down and start routing the traffic to the new leader. So this earlier time, mean time to repair, which is the common metric we use to mention how much time it took to your repair, which is commonly mentioned in RCS as well. So that is now reduced from earlier around 30, 40 minutes. So manual intervention, some would come for call and some would come down to the call and everything and fix it. It's now less than a second. So this is how Patroni works with the help of uh, leader, huh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So this is also has the same problem. <coughs> uh, the thing here is that this is also has a master leader, leader and uh, multiple followers. So like console, we would provision a console node with one leader and five followers. So that in case the leader went down, the follower would become would become the leader. So that same thing is being transferred to the DCS cluster as well. That same principle of automatic failover. So this process itself would be called as an automatic failover. Earlier, the failover would have been done by promoting man, ma manually promoting the replica to the master and everything. So this is how it takes place. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So what happens, I'll show the whole flow, how it works, but the, when the fail leader comes back up again, it will join the cluster as a replica. It will sync back with the original leader that how much data have I missed in terms of the right ahead logs, and it will join the cluster back as a replica. So that's what it is. The, the status of the cluster and everything, how the configuration should be, is stored in the DCS itself. You can consider DCS as a key store as well. So the next thing is that what Patroni solves is that you, it allows you to maintain uh, global configuration. Let's say I wanted to update uh, my shared buffers to 2GB or whatever. What it would do is that the Patroni would take care of the updation, apply it on the PostgreSQL process, and relay that information back to the DCS. So that DCS know that the, all the cluster needs to be applied that new configuration. Because DCS is the only source of truth here. We would not touch the DCS at all. And that knows what is the configuration which has been running on the leader replica and other replica, right? So sometimes people would go ahead and drift from the actual configuration which is in the DCS, which is a sort of truth. That causes a lot of issues. So the best way is to make sure that you always go via the DCS route and make sure that it is always same. The configuration is always same on the Postgres process, which is on the DCS as well. So similarly, what would happen is that 
it would be applied to all the nodes and uh, it would be prompted to the user to maybe reload or restart the PG process. But Tony would self take care of knowing that which of the process, which of the configurations which requires a reload, which of the configuration requires a restart. If it requires a restart, it will give you an alert that do a pending restart or something. Reload it will do manually, auto sorry, automatically. So just a few things about uh, Patroni. It's almost instantaneous. You would uh, not even, like people who have been working with Kubernetes, right? You would see that whenever you do a rolling upgrade, it takes, you take, take the old nodes down and spin up the new nodes, right? It's almost instantaneous and the traffic does not flow that well. So that's a similar process in this as well. Whenever we are doing maintenance or something on a Patroni cluster, We'll take, we'll upgrade the leader replicas, then we'll upgrade the leader. So similar to a rolling up it. And that failover helps us in that case as well. So that's a planned failover. Uh, the, 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 the case I was mentioning earlier was an unplanned failover. Uh, it's way cheaper than running managed TV stores. A lot of people would be running uh, RDS or anything. And it, it says that it's going to be available. It is definitely, but it's, it's, it's expensive. And when you are running that, that skill expenses matter a lot. And, and now the, the sentiment is also is that you need to make sure that the money stays within, right? You don't spend a lot of money on cloud. So cheaper solutions which run better are a, are a more favorable option. Uh, cluster management is much easier because I explained earlier, but Tony gives you a REST API so that you can know which of the node is later at any point, which of the node is replica at any point. I want to do a switch over, I want to do a failover. I can do everything via APIs. So I can write clients over that API and expose them on an, any interface, like a CLI or like a web interface. So that, that makes life easier for the database management team to handle it, for the application team to handle it. So that we, our, our goal is to uh, abstract all that out for the application owner. So that application owner clicks one thing and you perform a rolling upgrade or you perform a failover, you perform a scale up or whatever. There's one more thing is that it also supports multi-region deployments. It's like, I have said, as I said earlier, that one of the regions would go down. You would want that your database is present in one or more regions, like Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia. It should be present in all. So I'll discuss that as well. So this just, uh, I don't know if I should mention GCP here, but let's go. <laughs> uh, uh, it says that AlloyDB is uh, similar to RDS on, uh, on GCP. It says that it costs around $1,000 per month. But if I would run a 2 dB Patroni cluster, it would cause me with the same configurations, uh, even, yeah, almost the same configurations, it would cost me almost half with disks and everything included. So it costs me around half of that. And imagine that we have 500 clusters. So we have annual standards, annual standard four or like, I'm not sure what the AWS equivalent is, uh, those are four core boxes. We have 64 core boxes, 32 core boxes. The one I was mentioning earlier was the allocation service that has 64 core box. And those, the, the difference increases exponentially when you have bigger, bigger VMs present. So that's one thing that is cheaper, definitely. So now it's, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, definitely. So that's that's one thing that uh, automatic upgrades. I want to there's a new version of Postgres coming in. I want to upgrade it. There's a bug fix patch going on, like a security vulnerability. But don't you want to take care of that? As mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what the thing is that you have to build tooling on top of it. It allows you the interfaces, but you need to build tooling on top of it. Uh, it allows you to create, uh, perform more version upgrades. It's possible to do a logical replication. I won't explain this because that's a bit too into process, but if you can do logic, logical replication globally to uh, upgrade to a different node, but that's a manual job. That's what the thing is that it offers, it's, ex, it's less expensive, but it comes at a few maintenance things, which the DBT, which, which we basically do, that's that we automate and we ensure that 
those are streamlined version upgrades scale ups like whenever someone's cpu is hitting 80 percent we just turn a few steps and uh, every, it becomes scaled up with the we have written processes around patroni itself that it can be done so i'll just do a brief about how patroni works like very brief uh, very other the the one before was very high level this would be very uh, deep into how it works. So the whenever the Patroni process starts, it starts the, okay, let me go into this. This was a, can you see it? It's, it's a bit blurry, right? The, the text is a bit small. I had generated this graph from graph because it did not allow me to do it better than this. Are you able to see? Right? So what happens whenever the hello? Yeah. What happens whenever the Patroni process starts up is that it starts the DCS initializes the console, which is the DCS here, initializes the PostgreSQL process, and then initializes the REST API and make sure that everything is paid. But I'll explain how the process looks like. It initializes the HA loop. So, like it's a loop which is running every X seconds, like one second or less than one second, and it's syncing the state of the current cluster with the DCS. Yeah, so it's syncing the current state of the cluster with the DCS at every point of time. And this is the loop which runs every very smaller interval to make sure what is the status of the pro uh, cluster. So it, if it's whenever you start a cluster, not new cluster, let's say, it would load the cluster from the DCS. If, if it's a new node, it will uh, add that node in the DCS configuration. And then if it's not, then it will just check if it's working, if it's starting or not. And so it will also check a few things about if the cluster was failed earlier, if it's not, if it was not working, it will remove the leader lock and say that you're not the leader anymore. We'll start the leader election again. It will also check if the data folder is empty. Let's say if there's already some data on the Postgres cluster, it will go ahead. And then if it's not, then it will start the bootstrapping process, which I discussed in the later stage in the next slide. And then it would uh, initialize the cluster, check if it has a leader or not. If it doesn't have, then it will initialize the new cluster and add it into DCS. If it has, then it will check that the node, if the Postgres process is healthy or not. And then check if the, uh, the cluster has a leader or not, because the leader is being checked by the leader lock. The leader lock is continuously updated on the DCS. That is being checked, and then it checks in the if if the if the Patroni process cluster is unhealthy, it will check uh, it will go ahead and uh, mark that current node which if it's healthy as the as the healthiest node. If it's not, then it will try to follow another leader, and it will if the if it wins the leader race, which is done by the consensus raft algorithm. I would not go into explaining it because it will take around huh? how much time. Okay. I'll, I'll take five, five minutes. Yeah, that's almost most of it, how the process looks like. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just, this is the node bootstrap process, which is very similar to that. I will share this as well. One more interesting thing in the, Patroni is that you it what uh, yeah you were mentioning is that what happens in case the console goes down if the DCS goes down Patroni implemented a very special thing is that it has it turns on pure raft as well you would just uh, need to raft is the raft consistent algorithm so it has a Python implementation of raft working on itself as well so you can rely on not using any DCS at all and you can uh, use the sync by sync OBJ uh, uh, library to make sure that this particular 
data is being replicated to all the all the all the nodes. So it initializes with the uh, sync OBGA uh, class, and then you need to define what are the addresses where you need to replicate that data. And whatever app, whatever action you want to do, you can use the replicated decorator over that. So it uses that itself to um, manage the loud thing as well to remove the remove the dependency on the DCS. So adding, I just asked Chat PPT that if in case you would in a normal cluster, what would happen is that there, let's say that there are three nodes of a cluster, and any one of them needs to be up for the whole cluster to be up. So like if one two of them goes down and one is up, the cluster is up. The, the uptime would be calculated by that formula, which is taken from a reliability engineering journal. And it comes down to almost, I don't know how many lines are those, but ideally that is the thing that it will come down to very less than a second, but it's not practical. I'll explain why it's not practical because the replication, everything takes time. And there, if there's a very high throughput thing, but Tony will make sure that the replication takes time and the replication will complete and then only the failover happens because there's no loss in the data. That takes a few seconds, but that's still less than 52 minutes. It, it wouldn't, it, if a normal running cluster is there without maintenance operations, for unplanned downtime, it would be less than five seconds in the whole year, which is very, almost five minutes of our time. I just cut short to this, what we are running right now. We have currently around 200 plus clusters on production and uh, we are running almost 60 TV of data in and out every day. And we guarantee around like our backup strategy guarantees around like 10 MBs of data loss, if less than that, in case of a worst case scenario, like that region goes down. And uh, we use console GCS, I agree. And we do have ISC. I will not go into this. This is the graph which looks like that, how much data we get in, which is the tunnel graph. This is the uh, installation of the tunnel, how much bytes we get per day. So this looks like weird, but that's what the, around 60 TV looks like. Uh, one more thing is that the I was talking about multi-region. This is similar to multi-region is that, oh yeah, yep. You, you can have the nodes DCS cluster in each of the, uh, oh no, this is what, yeah. In each of the region and you can use console to redirect your reads and writes to wherever you want to. And this is how we uh, make sure that less than 10, 10 MB of data loss is there because we are shipping the walls which are generated every six, 10 MBs of data to a cloud storage. And we have written a logic by which we could generate the walls and we could fetch the walls back whenever you want to boost up the cluster with it, which guarantees very less, almost less than uh, one 10 MBs of loss, which we have calculated earlier as well. Yep, that's it. Have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so there were a few more extensions like, uh, uh, I mean, we went the RDL, the managed solution route, but that was costing a lot, Cloud SQL basically, but that was costing us a lot. And that's why we came back to a managed solution. There were a bit few downsides, we used a few extensions called Citus, there's a Citus extension. We use that as well, but that is also not serving us because that's a bit- It will be supported by Patroni as well, right? Citus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it will. Now it is. Earlier it was, I'm not sure when we were doing it at that time, but now, now it is supported. So we did a few, check, few uh, checks before, but this is what we came back to. Uh, mostly few extensions. There was a Postgres operator which we checked and there was a Barcona system which we checked, but that, that, that was, this is what is easiest and this was the most open source so we could uh, figure out what's going on here. Yeah. Uh -huh. How did you decide that, you know, like, Shifting is not going to, I mean, I think kind of people say, how do you know that it's going to work, right? Because you shifted to this one, but how do you know whether it's going to work or not? You did, you did put in some time for monitor and all of them and look at it or? What we did is that we uh, did a POC basically, which checked how it will go. We put it under extreme load and we did failovers under load extreme load. Like we, we simulated load via JMeter scripts to make sure that the, how much load is actual load of production is coming and then we did failovers to see how much data is being lost, how much graphics is being, how much packets are being getting lost in the one, two seconds of failover, how much time it's taking. And then we came to a conclusion that this is probably a solution which will work. And then we experimented into some systems as well. 
this is by no means just a 40 minute talk so this is this deserves a full session of its own yeah yeah definitely but uh, is there an engineering blog that you guys have on this migration no uh, we, I'm, we are planning to write it, so okay. it's just a start. I, there's so many things to talk about. I just ran out of time. <laughs> exactly. So you ran out of time. So you ran through the last bit, which is fairly impressive work, right? So would have like to learn more. So yeah, thank we you. would write a blog on this. Yeah. Thank you. Questions. Uh, approximately how much time did it take you to settle on ki, uh, this problem needed to be solved and implementing it finally? So it started around 2019, 2018 that we are actually facing this issue. And from 2020, a few people, I was not part of that team, but few people started doing the POC that this needs to be done and how the POC would look like. That took around six months to do the POC to do actual testing. And then we started a few other teams started building it from the ground up. And then we had like sure. around 50, 60 clusters at that point. And then we took all the tooling, went back into one team as a consolidated team. And then now we are around like 400, 500 clusters strong. So that whole process took around like three or three years or so. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Abhijit. Next, we have Abhiram. Thank you, Abhishek. And uh, thank you also for coordinating with Gojek to provide us a space today. And um, again, I know that we've all been delayed by a few 30 minutes or so. So I'll try and cut short my talk in the interest of time. And, uh, you know, I say that as if I'm doing you guys a favor, but my talk will actually not take that much time. Okay, so it will be shorter than all the intense sessions that we have had so far. Uh, it is actually drawing on top of what uh, Sashita sir just uh, spoke in the talk prior to this. Uh, we learned about the vector DB, one particular instance of it, and uh, a little bit of context before that. Um, so what I'll be talking today is about um, a usage of it, an application of it using, um, I initially the talk was titled Lang Chain, uh, sorry, Lang Flow, which directly, not yet, not yet, I will connect to it, but I don't know what link is, what is the link? Need a, I have so. No. So yeah, this is a drawing on top of Sashidhar Sir's talk, and um, Lang flow is one particular way of um, you know chaining your different components of LLMs together to form an LLM-based application, a large language-based application, large language model-based application. And today I'll be talking about flow wise because yesterday when I was like researching for the talk and stuff, I found this a little bit more interesting, right? So I'm going to talk about that and you're not losing too much. It's, this is not a deception. Uh, it is a parallel as in like, instead of uh, lang flow, you can use flow wise and this is an open source uh, solution as well. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'll draw parallels to what lang chain also offers, uh, lang flow also offers and um, how you can use it to build a small application. Oh, okay. Is my uh, one second. So, how many of you have actually played around with uh, something similar to Langflow? Okay, how many of you have used LLM um, like natively? How many of you used Chat GPT? Right. Okay, cool. So, uh, I'm not totally uh, alienating everyone. So you used it as a user, right? Now you can use it as a developer, okay? And to do this, you don't need to know too much of Python. You can use just the components. It is drag and drop. But what will help is if you know the underlying working behind it as well, right? So Sashita has showed you how to write a notebook with all the Langchain based uh, code, right? So I'll show you how the abstracted version of it looks like and what components is using underneath.
Ya, ya cari mau. Yes. Ah, it's okay. Switch off my oh, yeah, yeah. It's already moved. Yeah. Please share screen. Yeah, it's good. Oh yeah, so I'm Abhiram. Okay, that's, I should have started with that. And uh, I'm a senior ML engineer at a company called O9 Solutions. We provide a supply chain platform for any company that uh, needs it, right? Basically, we have demand planning, supply chain inventory management, and a lot of different solutions for different companies. Um, and I'm on the R&D side of things. I manage the pipelines for the company. I'm a, I'm a plumber, right? But uh, with data. Right, and uh, I have a small little blog that I maintain now, everything python.substack.com. This is a plugin, right? Um, and I will be, uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is because whatever I speak about right now, I will be chronicling it on that blog. So you can follow there if you're not following here, right? Um, so the basic installation of uh, Flowwise is using Node, right? It's not using Python, ironically, but uh, you install it using Node and the reason um, I was comfortable using it is because it is using Langchain, which is completely, it has a Python based, uh, you know, like workflow to it, right? So you install it using NPM and then you just say NPX flowwise start, right? So what it looks like and what it offers is basically a canvas, okay, like MS Paint. And in MS Paint, you have a set of uh, a toolbar on the left hand side with a lot of tools, right? So uh, Langflow and flowwise offers a canvas with all the components that um, an LLM based application will need. Some of those components are here, right? So you have a conversational retrieval, QA chain, chat model, embeddings, vector, DB. I'll, I'll explain what each of these are. And these are some components in the mega, you know, like list of components that are available to you in a LLM application um, implementation. But my uh, sample application today is going to be uh, as a sort of chatbot. Right, um, Shashita sir talked about, um, you know, like you have Kaggle new, uh, news articles from Kaggle where you ask a question and it programmatically gives you an answer from a list of selected answers, which it has matched using a cosine similarity, right? So this is similar, but what I'm going to talk about is, um, so uh, um, like um, to teach students, right? Like right now students go through a lot of, um, you know, tuitions and classes and they're learning in different ways. But um, now we can use AI as well to teach them, right? So what I have taken is to um, teach, I, I teach uh, on the side as well. So um, to teach one of my students, what I did was I used their CBSC science textbooks and uh, those documents are what I fed as the rag based, uh, you know, like uh, the augmented generation that I wanted to do. I added those documents to my chatbot. And when I ask it questions, it'll give me answers from that particular document. Right, so that is what I'm going to demonstrate today. And the vector DB that I'm using is an in-memory database. So uh, we previously heard about the Milvenus database, right? Milvus, Milvus, right? So that is one of the most popular open source databases, but I'm using an in-memory database, which means that you are limited by your uh, system's capacity. You can use a cloud-based technique as well, but you know, these textbooks are very small. Right. The other components here are a chat model, embeddings you need because you can't directly, like we heard before, you can't load the entire PDF into it, right? So you have to chunk it and you have to store it. And the chunking is done by the uh, recursive character text splitter. Now, with all of these components in mind, you can look at the canvas and see where they fit in. With me so far, huh? volume. Font, okay. 
same indication so okay so this is what the canvas looks like and a completely blank canvas would look like this okay, let me create a new one okay so this is what a completely blank canvas looks like you've seen it in multiple applications this is where everyone starts with um, but here are the different components that we have, right? So you can have agents, cache, chains, chart models. And one thing I want to explain, uh, mention is this is built directly on top of LangChain. So whatever LangChain offers, uh, LangChain is a workflow um, automation tool, which, um, uh, which will let you leverage all the things that OpenAI can give you by way of abstracted components, right? So for example, these are the different components that are available agents, cache, chains, chat models, embeddings, LLMs, memories. I I highly encourage everyone to go through the Langflow documentation, Lang chain documentation, to uh, go see what are what the different components are. Uh, but today we are going to be using only a few of them, right? Uh, coming back to this thing. So this is hosted directly on my local when I did the npm install and the npx. Um, flow wise start. This is what shows up on your local host at a port 3000 configurable. And uh, I have created two of these. So let me show you the first one. Uh, we'll go from right to left. Like this is not Urdu, but it helps. Okay. Okay. So the conversational retrieval QA chain. This is what is doing the bulk of the work. Okay, as in like it is um, communicating with the language model, the embedding, the, the vector store, and it is actually doing the conversation part, right? So what you do, what you're using when you use Chat GPT is part of that conversation, right? So when you ask what is the capital of Delhi, now what is the capital of India? It says Delhi. Now when the next question can be, what about Karnataka, right? It'll say Bangalore without even uh, it is Bangalore, right? Yeah, without even thinking too much. Right, because it won't um, consider the fact that what are you asking about Bangalore? It won't ask me the question. It is maintaining context from the previous conversation and saying that you are probably looking for the capital of this new place. So what is happening there? What about Bangalore? First, it's parsing, right? It's doing the NER to understand, name entity recognition to understand that Bangalore is a, probably a location, right? And it's, then it's maintaining the state from the previous conversation and saying, you asked for the capital of a particular location. I'm going to do the similar mapping for the next question that you've asked. I'm going to return the capital of Bank of Karnataka, right? So uh, that is what that is where memory comes in and uh, the vector store retriever. So uh, the data in question that I have here is my little science chapter. Right. And that cannot be fed in its bulk. I need to probably chunk it and store it. And that chunker is. On the left hand side, the recursive character text splitter. I'm choosing my chunk size as 500 in this example. And um, this is a bit of a hit or miss, right? Because depending on the data set, the context needs to be maintained in different chunks, right? For example, if you have news articles, you can probably get away with smaller chunk sizes because no two news articles need to be related to each other. But then when you come to something like science documents, um, the beginning and the ending probably need to have a callback, right? So for example, if you have like a movie script, right? That becomes a little bit more relevant. So um, we have to experiment with different chunk sizes and also have to keep in mind that the token size for all of these models is different, right? So you can't overwhelm the model with a huge token size at one shot, then you will, you will probably exceed your quota, right? So uh, this here, I've given the chunk size as 500 and the overlap is 20. And the PDF file component, so this is one more component that Flowwise offers, which also Langflow offers, that you can upload any type of um, text file, right? Like text file, CSV, XLS. And I think they are, you know, like the, the category of number of files is improving over time. Um, so this is the PDF file that I've, PDF file component that I've used. And then you can chain it all together, right? So whatever Shashita sh showed you in um, like a notebook sort of representation where one action follows the other 
is a, a visual representation here, right? Where, where you can actually see the chain of events happening. Um, so let's see it in action. Uh, after you um, are done chaining all of your components, what you have to do is two things. First thing is you have to load up your vector database and um, absurd, right? So if you've already done the insert, insert the first time you're inserting, the absurd is an insert, right? The second time is an updation, right? Uh, so once that is done, and you can keep track of it here also because your server is running here and uh, you can see the APIs on the back end that are happening, right? With me so far? Okay. And finally you save it. Why? Something is in my way. So let's clear the chat. Okay. And for context, this is the documentation the document I've used to upload. This is uh, chapter three of 10th standard CBSC. Okay. Like take my word for it. It's accurate. I'm sure it's been like a lot of years since people remember all this. So I have a sort of, you know, like, because demos are always flaky, I have this demo script that I've prepared in advance so that, you know, like I know what answers to expect, right? Otherwise we can always play around with some more questions later on, but we're going to try out a few questions and um, let's see. So I'm asking which non-metal is lustrous and it will give me the answer iodine, right? Because iodine is a non-metal that's lustrous, but, but how do you know that it's coming from the documentation and not from the internet, right? So um, the next question I asked is, which page did you find this on? Right? Like, because um, it'll tell me that since it's on, what, you don't know the answer, it's there, dude, okay. Take my word for it that it worked in the past. And uh, the answer it gave me was it was on page number 40. Okay. Because um, actually I prefer that the answer is I don't know, right? Sometimes it'll give you the answer that it's on page number 200. And it's clearly hallucinating because first of all, the number of pages in my document is 10, right? And the second thing is if it found it off of some particular file off of the internet, it should provide the source for that as well. Right, so I don't know is an answer that is preferable in your production based scenarios as well, because when a customer is asking a question, you would rather give them uh, the um, so the, the impression of humility than of you know like overconfidence, right? Because you don't want to say uh, something that is clearly apparently wrong, right? So I don't know is better, but let's ask it again. Just see, right? I don't know. I have not tried this before, so let's see. Right, so it's not possible. So I think I know what happened because I uploaded the text, but I did not save it, right? I think that's the problem because this talking town hall thing covered it, right? So it's like, let's see again. Okay, second time is a charm. All right, it's okay, worth a shot, right? So anyway, um, you will know that when I publish the blog for this, it will have the right answer because in some way I'm going to get that answer, okay? Um, but yeah, this is how you probably, you, you change the whole thing and you, you know, upload a document, find the answer from within the document. And, and um, now if it is in this format, it is of no use to anyone except you. Okay, and probably bragging rights in a meetup, right? At uh, 140. 
so how would you put this in a real world scenario how will you export it right so uh, flowwise also lets you embed the code in uh, like whatever code was used in the back end to generate all this right you can take the code in two different formats one in javascript and in python and you can embed it on your uh, web pages okay and i've already done that so so yeah you can do it in multiple ways one is as a chatbot Correct, 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 exactly, exactly. So the canvas part is over, right? The part is over. This is, yes, yes, correct. Yes, yeah, correct. It is offering an API endpoint effectively. So you can put it anywhere you want and uh, like based on where you're hosting it, you can use it. So there isn't, but uh, it is open source. So we can we can add that thumbs up and thumbs down and add scores for it uh, ourselves, right? Um, actually, a good idea. I'll try that. Yeah. Yeah. So for like, if you, if you want to do it for a separate application, like I have application, I want to deploy this thing. So I, I would need to deploy it on, on my own system. As you said, it's open source, right? I would need to deploy it on my own system, make my own uh, embeddings and everything, and then expose this as a separate uh, service, right? And then for it to use on my website. Is that so? Or can it be used from anywhere? Um, I was with you for the first part. From it, from anywhere meaning? From anywhere, like from any cloud, any any. From any see, if you have like some AWS Lambda service running, hmm. where you can run this off of a server. Like, okay. Uh, just run the server, and you can have an endpoint to that particular service, right? Could, you can run it anywhere. It would be a public endpoint as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. It doesn't have to be a public endpoint. Any, it any, has authentication as well. Oh, sure. Right. So when I embed it, I am saying without the authentication, but you can provide authentication as well, like uh, have a token or something. Good. Uh, so, yeah, so here uh, I asked the question, what happens when metals are burnt in air? It is taking this uh, plate apparently from the textbook and it's giving me an answer. But I asked you, ask them, which page did you find this on? The source of the information is a science textbook, right? Like this is okay. I mean, like acceptable, but not correct, right? So then I figured that uh, it's probably because of the size of the chunk. Right, because my size of the chunk right now is 500 and it doesn't have enough context to understand the metadata of this particular um, content right so i made one more canvas application and this time the chunk size is 2000 okay uh, is it big enough it's 2000 okay Okay. So, and uh, this time when I run it, the actual heading comes up, you know, it says comes in section 3.2.1, which is actually correct, right? Let's see if it works here. All right, so yeah. Correct, but uh, this chunk actually considers the metadata as well, right? So it should be able to give you that answer. It is chunking along with the page number. So uh, technically it should be able to give it. I'll see why it's not, yeah. 3.5 uh, turbo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh, that's one more thing, thank you for asking. Hmm. I have not, I have not. Yeah. 
I see. Now it's possible that it is losing context when it is chunking and you know like embedding. Which one did you use? Which one? Okay. Um, three point five might be like uh, he mentioned, right? Uh, Chat GPT and sorry, uh, OpenAI and uh, Bard and all probably perform better than any of the open source models. Uh, So one suggestion I have is, um, you know, like before all of these LLMs came up, we were pre-processing pre PDFs, right? So you can probably pre-process those PDFs to convert them to Markdown, right? And then pass it into- um, Yeah, you know, basically we have to scrape the PDF. Yeah. The uh, PDF scraping is also a bit, big challenge itself. In, it has like, been challenging. Don't, cha don't use it, don't do it using LLM. No, right. we are not using LLM to scrape the PDF. Right. Uh, we're basically using like there are different uh, PDF scraper tools which are like in Python as well. Yeah, yeah. But for like for final, especially financial reports, uh, we're not we didn't get good results while even using PDF scraper tools. We used like OCRs and stuff like before that company's uh, financial report. We couldn't good get a uh, good result. So I just yeah, 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 yeah. Is it an image? Yeah, like we have both co combinations of image and uh, normal. Yeah, that's See, limited by your base problem itself, right? Like if it's the, it is not parsable. Yeah, that it's not data parsable is... to begin with. So you have to do some heavy pre-processing before you can actually feed it to LLM and expect it to be better. Yeah. Right. Again, all of these models are at the mercy of the data. Right. Yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you asked me about the models. So this this particular component is what you can use to change the model. I am using the open uh, chat open API uh, component, but you can use Azure. Uh, you can use whatever is offering uh, that particular credential, right? And you can set your model as well, 3.54, what have you. Llama index is uh, supported. I don't know what other is supported. They have a whole variety of them. No, no, one second. I think uh, we can see right now. So chat, Google, chat, hugging face is allowed, chat locally. Uh, so local LMs are also supported. Yeah. yeah. So you can use this, uh, you can host it on your local. But the more you host, the more load you're adding on your own system. So I don't know, by the time you get to the end product, you might not be able to, right? So. <laughs> Right, right. So you you have to localize it. So in in companies, you probably are not limited by infra, right? You can you can uh, request uh, requ like uh, support like uh, submit a uh, infra request. Yeah. So I suppose that is what I had, and uh, it would have been lovely to see the page numbers, but you know you can check it out uh, on the blog later on, and. Um, yeah, the alternatives are, of course, like Langflow and there are a few more, like Auto GPT is there, I think. Um, and now everyone is building their own workflow uh, application as well, because not everyone has the time or the knowledge to write code, right? So this sort of a no code um, thing is what is going to be the future of LLMs. So yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, I had a question. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so because this is obviously built on top of an existing model and you've given like the PDF file context to it uh, and you asked something uh, to it, there's no way for you to ensure that the- Correct. Yeah, so validity, right? Um, 
the validity can be ensured in two ways. One is you provide the text that you want to localize your searches on and give it that extra amount of help. And the second thing is you can ask it to cite its results, right? Like cite, uh, cite its sources, right? So it will provide you the references from where it actually got that information. And that's what in GPT-4 and all, if you see, right, uh, you can, you can, you will see those references. It says searching the right. internet and tells you where it got the information from. That gives you a little bit more of a confidence to where, uh, to see that it's valid. Um, but yeah, hallucination is still a problem. Um, but um, I think we can localize it. Okay. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, it will be able to because it depends on the model, chat model that I'm using, right? So I am using OpenAI. So it will, so while the primary focus search is on your textbook, the uh, extended universe is also available to you if you have that particular, if your model supports it, right? So uh, GPT-4 supports it, right? 3.5, I don't think it does. It is already pre-trained, right? So uh, that is what it depends on. And if your 3.5 model is also pre-trained, right? It can still give you the information from the knowledge that it already has. Maths is probably not, uh, you know, like it, it is, I'm sure a lot of maths is already fed into it, right? So right off of the internet, you can get 3.5 will give you the proof. So your, uh, by extension, your agent should also be able to do it. Yeah. Correct. And you can also train your, not train, sorry, you can prompt your uh, agent to do that, right? You can say, look into the context first and then look outside, right? That will, that way you can, again, give it a little bit of a boost. Shouldn't use the word train because you cannot train uh, the model when you're using it. Yeah. Like, uh, I had another question. Yes. Uh, I saw that you had used recursive text splitter, right? In this case, yes, yes. Yeah. Had you have you tested it on like using uh, character text splitter and token based text splitters? I have not. You know, you are not. Okay. Yeah, but it's, um, I'm going to experiment with, first of all, I want to know why you didn't throw up the page number. Or just, yeah, yeah. That was embarrassing thrice. Really. Happens. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Abhidam. And thank you all for coming out on the Saturday morning. A quick question. Do you prefer Saturday mornings or would you prefer Saturday evening? All are fine for a moment. Actually, that's now looking at it, it's uh, like the morning data set is right here. So obviously all the answers. Good question. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, right. So um, we have a mailing list. If you're not on there, feel free to join there because all the information about um, bank, bank pipers as well as other Python related events, uh, including PyCon India and so on, will be on that mailing list. <laughs> if you want to volunteer, this is a volunteer driven community. If you want to volunteer, you can come talk to us. Uh, Ritesh, me, Abhiram, and uh, other previous volunteers and organizers who were there. And uh, we have an active Discord group as well. Uh, if you want to join that, the link is also on the on both our Twitter and also on the main, on, also on the Meetup page. Um, one quick addition though, like uh, so far our Meetup uh, account was self-maintained, but now it's under the PSF. So it's easily it's more easily discoverable across the larger Python community under all the PSF umbrella. So that's one quick addition from the just happened this this last month. So yeah, this is this is the first one which which is coming out from there. Um, I think we would we would we usually have like lighting talks and uh, uh, sort of other things uh, like open house at the towards the end. But uh, we're already short on time and we are like we extended a, 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 a bit longer than we usually do. So we will skip lighting talks this time. 
but next next month again we will have it so if you want to present lightning talk which is like which is usually five to ten minutes talks if you want to present something very small uh, something that you're talking uh, uh, working on something exciting or should you, that, that you just want to share uh, a program that you're part of and you want others to join and so on and on right so the other things that you can present in a lightning talk and finally thanks to abhijit and gojek for providing us a space for this month <laughs> And thanks to everyone again for coming. Uh, we'll have a quick uh, group photo, um, like right here, and then you know you can talk about talk amongst uh, yourself and network.